Falling Free by Lois McMaster Bujold. So this is episode 18 of a series I'm doing called The Masterpieces of Science Fiction. It's 140 books that I'm reading through this list that was put together by Easton Press. And this book is on the list. It came out in 1988 and it won the Nebula Award that year for Best Novel. Now, most people have probably seen a lot of Lois's books in bookstores. She's written a really large series called the Vorkosigan Saga. And this book actually is in that universe. And I did a little research because I'm kind of a completionist when it comes to these things. And from what I can tell from what she said about the book and what others, this book is kind of a standalone in that universe. You could kind of read it whenever because the main series all revolves around this family, the Vorkosigans, and this book takes place 200 years before we ever get to meet them. So, you know, you can read this whenever. I'm really glad I read this because looking at a 15 book series, you could sometimes be a little intimidated. And so I was like, this is on the list, I'll give it a shot. And after reading it, I gotta say I was really happy with it. There was a couple things that were cons that I think in a larger series would be resolved. So I'm kind of excited to dig into the larger series at some point. It might be a while, I've got a lot of books to read between, um, you know, in the next couple years, but I'm glad, I'm glad I read it, and let's just get ahead, go ahead and get into the book review. So this story takes place on another part of our galaxy around this planet, and there's really no aliens from what I can tell in this universe that Lois has written here. And humans have figured out a way to travel faster than light through these kind of wormhole things. I, for, I forget exactly what they call them, but there's this kind of far off world that this corporation has a lease on so that they can basically mine it. And the main character of our story is sent to this world because he's going to train some people in welding, in zero G and some other maybe safety things and some other things that we just aren't completely told everything about. And he arrives and he's kind of getting the tour by the guy who's in charge of this whole planet-wide mining operation. And his name is Bruce. And we start to figure out pretty quick, he's, he's kind of the villain of this story. And he's gonna, he takes, he takes Leo up to this floating habitat that's up in orbit. And, and our main character, Leo, is kind of thinking, why would you have this this habitat up in orbit with these workers, like you'd have to send them back and forth to the planet so that the effects of zero G don't affect their, their bones and their muscles. And Bruce, you know, the guy in charge is kind of like, oh, don't worry, you, this will all, you'll see what's happening in a little bit. Don't worry about that. And so we come to find out on this floating habitat, there's 1500 people living on this thing. And 500 of them are just regular employees of this corporation doing various things and having to go back and forth between the planet. And then the other thousand are these genetically engineered humans and they call them quaddies. And if you look at the cover a little bit closer, you can tell the way this girl is holding the sign. They've been modified to have a second set of arms instead of legs. They've also been modified to be able to live in zero G without having any of the negative effects accumulate on them. So they could basically live up there indefinitely and work. And the company or the corporation's take on them are that their property, because they've been genetically engineered and our main character, Leo, he starts getting to know some of them and starts feeling some empathy for them. And so that's where the conflict of this story starts. Now these quaddies, these thousand quaddies that are up there, they had been kind of, 
you know, modified or created fairly recently. The oldest ones of them are in their like late teens or 20s. And most of them are even younger than that. And it's kind of some of our main quaddy side characters. Uh, two of them are kind of a mating pair and they were the first to actually be able to uh, reproduce in a normal way and so it's kind of a big deal they have a baby and the corporation's hoping that this can continue and they won't have to spend time you know reproducing these quaddies on their own they'll just let them handle it um, as needed and so that's all I kind of want to say about the the plot of the story you kind of get all of that thrown at you pretty quick. And, and so the rest of the book, and this is only a th like a 300 page book, the rest of it is just kind of the resolution of that conflict. So let's just go ahead and get into pros and cons. So the pros, I, I think Lois is really good at, at writing a good plot. She sucks you in right away. And then with her pacing, it just keeps you engaged. It didn't seem like there was many dull moments in this book, and it always kind of kept you wanting to read on to the next chapter to see what was going to happen. I think when it comes to the character work, this could be a pro or a con. I think she did a pretty good job in 300 pages fleshing out these characters, but I felt like it could have been more. And that's why I feel like in a bigger series where she's writing 15 books based on mostly this family, I think that's where her work would really shine. So while she kind of got it, got the characters fleshed out enough, I'm really excited to see what she could do with um, you know more page count and how she could suck you into these characters' lives even more. Now, when it comes to cons, there was some science that wasn't completely explained. I don't always have to have that, but just so you know, this isn't a hard science book. It does make it very approachable, but it does kind of leave you scratching your head a couple times because some things might be glossed over for the sake of moving the plot along. And Now, the only other con that I could really think of is this story is a little bit predictable, maybe very predictable, you, you realize pretty quick you have a hero and a villain and some other people in between. And while the overall plot was fairly predictable, the way it, it was resolved, there was a few little twists and turns in there that kind of kept you on your heels a little bit. But overall, I think you know what you're going to get when you start reading a book like this. But that, that's really all I could think of as some cons. Now, overall, I'm going to give this book a three. I think it's a high three. I'm really excited to see what she can do with a more fleshed out universe and characters. I think that's where her work will really shine. But I think this is just a solid book all around. There was nothing really that, that bad. And there was a lot of, you know, fairly good things all brought together into a nice story. Now, who I would recommend this to... I would have no qualms recommending this book to anybody, whether they've read science fiction or not. If you want a, a fun, intriguing plot with some action and good pacing and good characters, this, this will give you all of that. And it's all wrapped up in a 300-page little package. So that's all i got to say about that. Fun, enjoyable. And now what I'm on to next is another book on this list I'm doing the masterpieces of science fiction and it's Mortal Gods by Jonathan Fast. This is another one that's rated fairly low on the list as far as good read scores. So I'm trying to knock a few of those out and kind of get them out of the way. Some of them haven't been that bad, some of them are pretty bad. We'll see about this one. I don't see many people talking about this. It doesn't have many reviews on Goodreads and you wonder how it made it on the list, but it's 150 pages, I'll give it a shot. So look for a video review of that one in the future. And once again, thanks for watching.